Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the factions, faces, and forces of the Warhammer 40k setting. The grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace, there is only time for war. And today, I shall be reading some of the lore from the Leviathan main rulebook for the 10th edition of Warhammer 40,000. I am aware that some don't read the lore, but also it could be either a sleeping aid or something to put on while you are hobbying. So, let us get into some of the updates for the 10th edition of Warhammer 40k, the Soul Blades not being the least of them. Judge Herman Kranz of the Adeptus Arbites stood upon the bridge of the Punisher-class cruiser, Black Reckoning. He was troubled and angry. The Grand System had not paid its tithes this standard year. No communications had come from its worlds at all in that time, not even from local arbitrators. They might be dead. Worse, they might have turned against the Emperor. The Adeptus Arbites were a stern and devout breed, the law keepers of the Imperium, but they were also human. Ill-discipline could lead to disloyalty, disloyalty to heresy. The thought disgusted Kranz, made him want to take his shock maul and bludgeon something. The ship's bridge was alive with quiet professional activity. Everything was ordered and clean, down to the neatly pressed creases on the crew's black uniforms. The crew had clean-shaved scalps and the athletic bodies of those committed to physical robustness. On either side of the bridge's entrance stood an arbitrator, each holding a shotgun against their chest. A dozen more were stationed throughout the bridge, though each was motionless. Kranz knew they were ceaselessly scrutinizing their surroundings. He knew because he had once been one of them, and even now, years later, the habits remained ingrained. Though the crew were disciplined enough not to show it, Kranz could tell they were afraid of him. He cut an intimidating figure. He was tall, muscular and broad, and half of his head was a complex bionic with a piercing red lens, where his left eye had once been. A long purity seal hung from his right shoulder, upon which were written the names of twenty-three worlds, each of which he, as a judge, had subjected to the wrath of the Emperor's law. Soon he expected to add the three populated worlds of the Egran system to it. The Black Reckoning was not his only resource in this task. The Punisher-class cruisers Iron Justice, Righteous Revanche, and Authoritas Supremus joined it. All were heavily armed and armoured. They were transporting sufficient arbitrators to bring the Egran system to heel. Navigator Akrimena reports we are close, Judge, said one of the ship's officers. She notes some form of anomalous disturbance in the warp, but that such phenomena are not uncommon in this age. It is nothing she cannot adjust for. Very good, Ensign, said Kranz. Not uncommon indeed. These are dark days, requiring strong people, thought Kranz. That was why the Emperor had forged the Adeptus Arbites. Unfortunately, some humans chose not to abhor the shadows, but instead to revel in the darkness of their times. It was the task of the Arbitrators to root them out and expose them to the searing light of Imperial justice. Warp translation in three, two, one, complete. Navigator Akrimina's voice echoed from the bridge's vox speakers. Then she screamed. The inhuman howl of an animal in pain, magnified by her psychic talents and the remorseless clarity of the ship's systems. Even the well-drilled crew of the Black Reckoning grimaced at the sudden awful sound. Some clutched their heads. Kranz fought the urge to do the same. His head pounded and his eardrums felt as if they could tear at any moment. Looking around, he saw the ship's long-range auger displays were going haywire. 
Report, he demanded through gritted teeth. What is this? Unknown, sir, gasped an officer. Unknown, sir, gasped an officer, blood gushing from her nostrils. Open the war transit shutters. I need to see what's going on out there, Kranz demanded. The bridge's metal view screens slid up with a motorized hum. Holy Emperor, breathed Kranz. There were monsters everywhere. Kranz recognized them immediately from the Duranda evacuation. They were tyrannids. His skin crawled as nightmares long repressed sought to resurface. Panic threatened to close his mouth and choke him. Kranz remembered the screams, the alien howls, and the sight of entire rescue barks swallowed by things with carnivorous moors and nests of writhing tentacles. Now, without warning, he found his ship surrounded by thousands of the Xenos' hideous bio-ships. The Black Reckoning's auger officer pressed his rune keys rapidly, repeating soothing incantations intended to pacify a troubled machine spirit. He looked up helplessly, and Kranz saw panic welling up behind the man's eyes. There is no error, sir. Borspec's returns are... They're utterly overwhelmed. There were so many bioforms. The auger screens had filled entirely with their green contact runes. Its bilious glare was so bright it hurt Kranz's eyes. Though it was impossible to determine the feedback or speed of any individual contact amidst the blizzard of returns, Kranz was quite certain some of the swarm was descending on his ships even now. Around him, the bridge crew stared in horrified paralysis at the biofleet, or staggered back from their stations with cries of denial. So many, croaked one man, then louder as he turned in mindless flight. There's so many! An arbitrator's shotgun barked. Blood spattered Kranz's cheek. He wiped it away without so much as a glance at the ruined body of the deserter. Hold your stations! Kranz shouted, though he could feel his heart pounding with fear. The rest of the crew obeyed, but he could practically feel their panic like a greasy sheen on his skin. Kranz reminded himself sternly of his duty and took several steady breaths. There was no victory to be gained here, that much was clear. All the same, he had a duty to send a warning, no matter the cost. Setting his jaw, Kranz moved to loom over the ship's Vox officer. Put me through to the entire flotilla, all channels address. Anyone who might hear, he ordered. The Vox officer was shaking so badly, he almost dropped the handset as he handed it to Kranz. Navigator Akramina was still screaming. Shut her off! Kranz barked. The Vox speakers were silenced. He took another breath, then spoke firmly and steadily into the Vox. This is Judge Kranz. Remember your duty. Fear not the alien. Broadcast in every manner possible to any system we can reach. Tyranid biofleet encountered in a grand system, numbering thousands. All shipmasters, devote your focus to evasive maneuvers. We must buy time for the messages to be sent. Astropaths cannot send, sir, called the Vox officer, sounding close to panic. They drown amidst the shadow in the warp. Tell them to keep trying, snapped Kranz. The Tyranids were bearing down on them. Kranz could see the Iron Justice and Authoritas Supremus firing, blasting gory craters in the onrushing beasts. Yet in the space of a few minutes, the Iron Justice was pierced through with several mile-long chitinous spears, and the Authoritas Supremus was swathed in freshy sacks. They reminded Kranz of Grok's ticks but he realized with revulsion that they were organic boarding craft. Confronted by the grotesque speed of the destruction, even Kranz faltered for a moment, paralyzed by panic. Disgusted by his own fear, the judge bit his cheek until blood squirted over his tongue. The pain brought focus. Kranz spat crimson. Evade! Evade! he roared, prowling the bridge as the ship shook with impact. Fight! Every second we buy is more time in which we can send our warning. Despite the efforts of the ship's crew, the Black Reckoning took hit after hit. 
writhing and groaning as if in terrible pain. Damage hymnals filled the air with their keening notes. Multiple decks were venting atmosphere, and onboard casualty reports spiralled by the second. The huge Tyranid bioship closed in from all sides. Krantz saw alien moors opening wide, revealing dark, toothed pits where only death lay. Just as reports came through of the righteous revanche's destruction, Krantz heard the words he had prayed for. A report from his ship's astropathic sanctum suggested that a message might have gotten through. Though the sobbing aide reported astropath Jessera had ruptured every blood vessel in his body in the attempt. So be it, thought Krantz. The astropath had done his duty. Now he would finish doing his. Prepare automata sequence, he ordered. Make course direct for the nearest bioships. Sail into their midst. To our last, we will show the enemy our hatred. You are a credit to the Emperor's Adeptus Arbites, all of you. May he be with you until your last faithful breath. As a bioship grew larger in the bridge's vid screens, Kranz gripped a console and offered a silent prayer to the God Emperor that their deaths would have meaning and value. A darkness in the west. Something was coming, driving through the inky blackness of the interplanetary void with predatory determination. Inexorably, patiently, it pierced the wild reaches of the Segmentum Pacificus. There it would find prey not remotely prepared for it, prey that would soon find themselves caught in a nightmare worse than anything any of them had ever imagined. It began in absence and in silence. Deep void servitor satellites that had faithfully transmitted data for centuries suddenly ceased operation. Astropathic beacons dotted across the rimward fringes of the Asmodlex and Morphium sectors in the Segmentum Pacificus winked out one after another. The disappearances were incremental, as though dark ink was spreading slowly across the map of the void to occlude one glimmering psychic light after another. At first, the phenomena were missed even by the Asmodeux and Morphium sector commands. There were countless reasons why August stations and fringe colonies might drop out of communication, ranging from mundane equipment malfunction to solar storms. The Imperial bureaucracy was a vast and creaking edifice. It prized protocol above individual initiative, while its response times ranged from lumbering to glacial. There had been no distress calls, no word of pirates, heretical uprisings, or marauding Xenos, or indeed any of countless other threats that might beset an Imperial world. No word of a threat meant there was no threat to respond to. The gathering silence went unremarked. For the myriad adepts toiling in vast scriptorium halls of neighboring subsectors, no news from outlying planetary systems meant only that their mountainous and monotonous workloads became fractionally less. Amidst the endless clattering keys, the scratching of quills, and the thump of auto stampers, there was neither time nor desire for rumination on cause or effect. The Asmodioc system was already dealing with an orc war, wreaking havoc through its Polydara, Byroth, and Sheela subsectors, not to mention a migration of kind interrupting shipping between Ammonius and Neverdark. Twelve systems in the Morpheus sector, meanwhile, had been swallowed by the suddenly manifesting tides of warp storm Gogmagor. The resultant wars and disruption had captured the full attention of every officer, dignitary, and stratego from one end of the sector to the other. So it was that, amidst the sheer enormity of space and the endlessly multiplying travails of humanity, the slow spread of the dark zones were unnoticed for far longer than it should have. The Nightmare Revealed When Revelation came, it did so amidst the cascade of horrors even the most obtuse senior autopedant could not ignore. 
The threat had now drawn nigh to a major systems, and the signs of its onset were inescapable. Half of Morphium's sector command was slain after High Astropath Gadioth received a flood of delayed astropathic distress calls that overloaded his mind. Awash with terror and pain, the vision sending manifested as a slithering mass of tendrils, talons, and screaming faces that burst from him like a flitwing from its cocoon. The construct wrought butchery amongst the assembled worthies and Munitorum personnel before it was finally banished. Astromilitarum officers in the Byroth subsector reported a sudden cessation of greenskin assaults against their beleaguered defences. It was, according to one relief general, as though the orcs had simply run out of reinforcements to throw into the fight. The cause of this respite became clear soon enough. Relief turned to horror, as one by one. Those same worlds spared the scourge of the greenskins, were instead overrun by the tyranids that had devoured them. The factory systems of Tektros and Trinary Reach Cluster both came under ferocious attack. The former by a loose alliance of renegade warbands, and the latter by League of Votan fleet, looking for appropriate food, fuel, and raw materials. Imperial reinforcements were mustered in neighboring systems. Before they could take to the warp, however, Word came that the aggressors had pushed westward. They left seemingly victorious defenders in their wake, yet the triumphant missives from those systems faltered and fell silent soon enough, as a shadow in the warp settled over them. The mining stations of the Harata stars, the ten gilded worlds of the Mytolian belt, the macroed void decks of Templum II and Gethsemanax, all reported growing tides of refugees spilling from warp space aboard crowded and badly damaged vessels. Some ships were broken apart during translation from the warp. Some showed signs of catastrophic damage, apparently caused by acids or the crushing grip of vast tentacles and claws. Others were quarantined by system defense monitors after long-range bio-augury revealed Xenos infestations rampaging through their decks. These latter were invariably fired upon and destroyed, typically after increasingly hysterical vox exchanges with the interdiction craft. Even this was not enough to prevent hardy xenoforms and tyranid spores from penetrating the atmosphere of Onkolos, Metropophia, Philodan Prime, and a half dozen other imperial worlds. Xenocult infestations and blood alien uprisings followed. For every shipload of incoherent victims, there came another Imperial vessel whose occupants retained the discipline and sanity to report what they had seen. These survivors spoke of colossal Tyranid fleets that poured from the interstellar void like the crop-bane swarms of, of arable agri-worlds. Rogue traders and Imperial Navy officers described Tyranid macro-swarms sweeping across worlds like chitinous tidal waves and devouring everything before them. They spoke in haunted tones of the warp-deadening phenomena that rolled like a storm cloud before the Xenos onslaught. Paranoia and panic bred like vermin beneath their spiritual shadow, while vital psychers such as astropaths and navigators went insane or suffered catastrophic mental and physical collapse within hours of its onset. Gradually, a picture emerged that instilled dread in those Imperial Command personnel highly placed enough to see it. Two colossal new tendrils of High Fleet Leviathan had invaded Imperial space, their onslaughts apparently coordinated. One, the tendril even now uncoiling across the swathes of the Asmodioc Sector and pushing towards the western edge of the Vinor Sector, had descended from above the Galactic Plain. This tendril was given the codename Nautilon. The other, which had ripped open the underbelly of the Morphium sector, and was even now making inroads into the neighboring Cassidor Gulf, was christened Promethor. It became ever more inescapably clear that both of these vast Tyranid macro shoals, having burrowed their way further into the galactic plane, had now altered their headings were advancing on roughly parallel courses towards the galactic east. It was a route that, 
if not altered or halted, would see him then push into the outskirts of the Segmentum Solar itself, and eventually, in the worst possible case, bring them to the very threshold of Holy Terror itself. So went the conjecture at least. The distances between settled human systems, the wholly alien and ineffable nature of the Tyranids, the difficulty of garnering and compiling reliable information from worlds overrun by the rapacious aliens and silenced by their smothering psychic signal, all combined to render certainty a sparse commodity during the first stage of the Tyranids' onslaught. With few hard facts to rely upon, responses amongst the Imperial authorities were mixed. Some planetary governors stood their armies to high alert, commanding defences to be raised, trenches dug, and reinforcements sent to bolster their lines. For every such stalwart, however, there was another who abandoned their worlds aboard gilded void barks, fleeing with their wealth and their households, and leaving their people in panic disarray. Some Imperial forces, most notably space marines and fleets of the Imperial Navy, sought to counterattack the advancing Tyranids, grasping the true horror of their numerical disadvantage only after they had committed to battle. Others drew up their defence lines and held firm for as long as they could, attempting to give time for evacuations to be performed or precious relics and technologies to be saved. Thousands of tales of heroism, tragedy, cruelty, foolishness, and selfless bravery played out through the systems that found themselves in the Tunid's paths. Few of them would be recorded or remembered, for all vanished beneath the slowly spreading shadow of the Tunid attack. Yet there were those Imperial agents with a breadth of perspective to fully grasp the nature of the threat and the power to do something about it. Voices from the Darkness the Adeptus Custodes are the Imperium's greatest warriors. Based within the Imperium's palace on Holy Terra, it is their duty to protect the throne world and the master of mankind himself. Every custodian is utterly devoted to this goal, committing their every thought and deed to it even after the passage of centuries begins to incrementally atrophy their superhuman abilities. On the day when one of the Adeptus Custodes discovered their skills have degraded, to anything less than absolute perfection, they choose voluntary exile and exchange one form of vigilance for another. Swathing themselves in cloaks of shadow, vanishing into the myriad spaceways of the Imperium, they become the eyes of the Emperor, their ever watchful for developing threats. Some eyes of the Emperor maintain contact with one another, exchanging periodic missives, Others develop networks of faithful agents who extend the boundaries of their sight. Some remain within the systems of the Segmentum Solar, while others forge ever further from the throne world, seeking for dangers that, if unchecked, might grow to threaten the heartlands of the Imperium. It is from these latter that a coherent warning first reached not just the Segmentum Solar, but Terra itself. A frigate of the Imperial Navy named the Pinion hove into Terran orbital space, ignoring the established space lanes. It swept down towards the Lion's Gate spaceport and was swiftly challenged by more than a score of orbital defense platforms and battleships. In response, the Pinion broadcast ident codes with a clearance level so astronomically high that all those who processed them were later lobotomized and repurposed as servitors in order to keep them secret. Resistance to the Pinion's advance vanished at once. An emergency corridor was cleared through the dense orbital traffic by defense monitors who primed their lance batteries to make clear the penalty that came with obstructing the Pinion's passage. Just three passengers disembarked from the frigate, whose captain had pushed his engines to breaking point and worked many of his crew to death in his haste to reach Terra. All three were eyes of the Emperor. They cared nothing for the lives spent to speed them back to the throne world. All that mattered to them was securing an immediate audience with Captain General Trajan Valoris, the master of the Adeptus Custodes, and the only one to whom they would deliver their warning. Valoris maintained his own networks of informants, 
He had quiet arrangements with more than one agent of the inquisitorial ordos and access to some of the most accomplished seers and astropaths in the Imperium. Already he had heard hints of this new darkness spreading from the West. What his returned comrades told him now of Tendril's Nortelon and Primethor confirmed his darkest suppositions. As the foremost custodian, Vloris's word carried much weight with the other High Lords who ruled the Imperium alongside him in the Emperor's name. He wasted no time petitioning that august body for an appropriate and immediate response. At first, Valoris faced politicking and cynicism. They demanded to know what guarantees were there, that the threat was as severe as was being made out. Why hadn't clear astropathic warnings reached terror via the proper channels, but instead only these three messengers? What did Valoris expect the High Lords to do? when such vast forces had already been committed to Lord Gilliman's crusade. Some of the questions stem from obstinacy or fear, others from a desire to secure political advantage. The Captain General rebuffed some, quashed others, and soon had enough of the Imperium's ruling body convinced of the threat that his entreaties gained traction. So the vast cogs of the Imperial bureaucracy ground into motion, driving forward in turn the ponderous might of humanity's titanic war machine. Orders for mustering and redeployment flickered out into the void in a flurry of astropathic activity. Vast strategia bastions stirred to wakefulness, armies of servitors and tech priests breathing life into ancient command sanctums and cogitator fanes that soon swarmed with command personnel and munitorum facilitators of every rank. Gradually, the colossal mobilization of troops and material began that would be essential to waging this latest tyrannic war. Yet this would not only be a battle of defense and attrition, Valoris and others like him were not content to sit behind battlements and wait for the darkness to reach their walls. Aggressive Defense Vast numbers of Astromilitarum regiments formed the bulk of mankind's response to Leviathan's onslaught but marshalling them took time. Many regiments had to be extracted from existing war zones. These needed resupplying and reinforcement before being declared combat capable. Others had to be mustered from scratch and given at least the basic training their soldiers would need to prove effective. Logistical support convoys converged from multiple subsectors. Their vessels suffered the perils of the turbulent warp, a rapacious void pirates en route and every loss necessitated further requisitions and more time for them to be mobilized. All the while, Nortelon and Promethor crept closer. Other elite Imperial forces could react more promptly, and wasted no time in doing so. Strike forces of the Adeptus Astartes, missions of the Adeptus Sororitas, questing lances of the Night Houses, the personal retinues of highly placed tech magi from the Adeptus Mechanicus. These forces, and others like them, had the capacity to launch counterattacks against the advancing Tyranids, rather than wait to be trapped in purely defensive wars of survival. Some individuals set out in isolation to pursue their own agendas, most notably from amongst the Adeptus Mechanicus's secretive and acquisitive priesthood. The majority, though, were organized into small, rapid-response fleets that were named Sol Blades, and often numbered no more than two or three warships apiece. These were to be swords drawn in humanity's defense, placed in the hands of heroes, and wielded against the monstrous tendrils of High Fleet Leviathan. Due to the paucity of information about the Tyranids' dispositions and goals, the Sol Blades were given huge strategic autonomy. Beyond being assigned one or other of the tendrils to assail, they were otherwise trusted to gauge the situation on the front lines and react accordingly. It was hoped that their comparatively low manpower, high mobility and specialist warriors would enable them to move swiftly and conduct a hit-and-run war against the mass Tyranids, where larger and more unwieldy military formations might become entangled amidst the swarm's masses. Many Sol Blades were commanded by, and largely comprised, Space Marines, Captains, Lieutenants, Librarians, Chaplains, and, 
in a few rare cases, even ancient dreadnoughts from numerous chapters led by soul blades into the darkness. Some were already renowned across entire segmentums, individuals such as Ultramarine's first captain, Agimon, chapter master Caven Shrike of the Raven Guard, and the famed alien hunter and battle psyche epistolary Drakt of the Necropolis Hawks. Others had yet to forge such magnificent personal legends, but would have all too many opportunities to do so in the battles to come. These soul blades, typically centered around a strike cruiser or squadron of frigates hailing from their commander's chapter, carrying a potent complement of battle brothers and war engines. Some were accompanied by skilled allies, such as the alien hunting warriors of the Death Watch or the battle-scarred shock troops of the Militarum Tempestus. Others sailed the void in company with space marines from brother chapters with whom they shared bonds of martial honor. Other soul blades set out led by the high nobles of night houses, or the canonesses of Adepta Sororitas orders. Mars's own knightly house, House Tyrannis, contributed no less than a score of its barons and baronesses to lead compact war fleets, each bringing at least a lance of their house's towering war engines to the crusade. Not to be outdone, the convent Prioris on Terra supplied numerous canonesses and palatines from the orders of the Ebon Chalice, Argent Shroud, Sacred Rose, and others, to lead soul blades of their own. These forces were the most zealous of all the response fleet, and typically the most numerous. For, along with the warships of the Battle Sisters, Black Templars, and other elite warriors of the faith, they were often trailed by shiploads of fanatics and flagellants, who wished to purge the alien threat and refused to be dissuaded. Even Trajan Valoris and a number of his fellow custodians took command of soul blades of their own. Their remit was the defense of the God Emperor's golden throne. They judged that in this dark hour they could fulfill their duties best at the bleeding edge of battle. Amidst great pomp and ceremony, one wave of soul blades after another set out from the core systems around Terra. They plunged into the warp full of determination to complete their missions and fueled by the fires of their unquenchable loathing for the aliens that threatened the Emperor's realm. They emerged into a chaotic nightmare that by now spread across a half-dozen sectors of Segmentum Pacifica space, and had already consumed dozens of Imperial worlds. Undaunted by the grotesque biological horrors and scenes of appalling catastrophe that confronted them, the Soul Blades sounded their battle cries and surged into the fight. The Anchor Worlds. All hoped that the Soul Blades would carve apart the Tyranid onslaught, the cream of humanity's finest forces, slaying the monstrous worms like heroes from legend. Outwardly, Lord Solar, Leontus, and his advisors were as bellicose as any in this respect. Behind closed doors, however, they counseled pragmatism before hope. They welcomed whatever victories the Soul Blades might win but in the event the Tyranid splinter fleets endured to push towards the heart of the Segmentum Solar, they felt a backup plan had to be in place. Though intelligence was vague, Leontus and his staff had worked hypotheses of the rough locations and projected paths of Nautilon and Promethor. Working from these, they identified multiple regions of Imperial space that straddled the nominal border between the Segmentum Pacificus and Solar and through which the Tyranid tendrils were most likely to push if they were not halted. Next, their army of adepts and scribes analyzed mountains of tithe reports, Navis Nobilitae Vox charts, inquisitorial assessments, and strategic omens. One by one, Lord Solar Leontus designated his anchor worlds. Each planet lay on a major warp transit route which, as best could be determined, remained a swift and relatively stable route towards the galactic west. Such channels were of no import to the Tyranids, but they would be crucial routes of maneuver and resupply for the Imperial armies charged with halting the Xenos advance. Each world occupied not only a planetary system, but also an entire subsector notable for its stable Imperial military and logistical network. Each would serve as an indomitable stronghold from which to support the Soul Blades and funnel the might of the Astra Militarum into the ongoing fight. In short, 
They would anchor the imperial effort in what was now being described as humanity's fourth tyrannic war. Worlds that met every criteria were vanishingly rare. They took a great deal of finding, and by the time they had been designated, the first immense wave of Imperial Guard and Imperial Navy forces was ready to be set forth. Constellations of Imperial warships dove into the maelstrom of the warp, led by the colossal Imperial Fist battle station, Phalanx. This mobile void fastness transported the Lord Solar and his vast array of command staff, as well as a sizable force of space marines, through the Imperium towards the most formidable anchor world of them all, the planet of Sanctum in the Bastior subsector. Into the Moor The Fourth Tyrannic War was now raging across multiple sectors of the Segmentum Pacificus. Lies beyond count had already been lost, an unknown destruction wrought before the Soul Blades even reached the front lines. Yet in truth, the greatest danger of all had not yet been revealed. That was about to change. Deploying into the pass of Promethor and Nautilon tendrils, the Soul Blades found themselves facing colossal concentrations of Tyranid forces advancing across wide, multi-system frontages. Continent-sized Xenos swarms swept across entire worlds like undulating chitinous floods. Hive ships with their smaller escort bio-vessels flowed through the void, thick as dragonflies above a corpse pit. Planets, void dock space stations, any site of permanent settlement or fortification that could not flee the Tyranid advance was either besieged or overrun. The tendrils did not move swiftly, however. Each comprised scores of smaller splinter fleets that intertwined and broke apart as new prey presented itself. Sometimes they doubled back to strike at enclaves of human or alien life that had endured the initial Tyranid attack and now lay behind the tendrils' lines of advance. They took their time, stripping worlds down to the last molecules of organic life, cracking open the deepest cores of fortified void stations to root out the flesh bounty within, while scouring settled asteroid fields and the like for hidden pockets of survivors. The biofleet's advance was inexorable, and their predation nigh inescapable. They could, however, be outpaced and outmaneuvered. Though many soul blades suffered terrible casualties in their ongoing battles against the Tyranids, their compact and fast-moving natures proved every bit as advantageous as had been hoped. The elite Imperial formations swept into battle with thrusters and guns blazing, often catching the Tyranids unaware or striking where their swarms on biofleets thinned. Time and again, they hit vital targets, affected rapid evacuations, or launched punishing combat drops that saw synaptic leader beasts slain, hive ships reduced to ruptured meat, and entire swarms recoil in pained confusion. Those imperial forces that did not pull out again quickly enough were ensnared and devoured. Casualties mounted swiftly. Still, the relentless pace of the Solblade's attack and the strategic cunning with which they fought saw them prevail on countless battlefields. Splinter fleets, pursued their human tormentors into the interstellar darkness, only for Solbades to outdistance the shadow in the warp and escape to the Empyrean, leaving their pursuers' jaws snapping on empty void. Sun Solbades garrisoned and reinforced the most defensible fortifications that lay in the Tyranid's path, then dug in for the inevitable onslaught. Such besieged citadels soon vanished beneath the shadow in the warp, and their defenders were rarely heard from again. However, each such successful campaign slowed the advance of another bio-fleet or hive swarm. Each brought time for fresh evacuations to take place, or the next line of defences to be further reinforced. Gradually, the assault of the Nautilon and Promethor tendrils stalled and began to fragment. Under constant attack from not only human, but also other alien aggressors, the Tyranid swarms started to look as though they might be defeated altogether. Yet more often than not, hope is a dangerous lie in the era Indomitus. Grendelus Rising The Tyranid's third and previously undetected tendril speared through the galactic plain into space considered well behind the lines of the Soul Blade's advance. The shadow in the warp billowed thick and dark before it, 
swallowing distress cries that might otherwise have alerted imperial authorities to the peril. Amidst the confusion, the mass migrations and widespread conflicts already triggered by Pramathor and Nautilon, warning signs or reports of hostilities were lost or misattributed. The Mozark Cluster, the Rentor Belt, Stather's Reach, and the leagues of Rotan enclaves of the Unhart Stars, all were devoured but went unmarked. It was a battle group from the Indomptus Crusade fleet Sextus that finally raised the alarm. The anchor world of Sanctum lay in the Formidre system, which was itself the linchpin of the Bastinor subsector. Since Lord Solar, Leontus, had embedded his vast command staff on Sanctum, and no lesser vessel than the Phalanx settled in its orbit, efforts had been redoubled to ensure the anchor world's security. No threat could be countenanced to such high-profile imperial heroes or military assets, and so battlegroup Faustus had been charged with sweeping the subsector's outer systems. Broken into more than a dozen task forces, the battle group was ordered to purge any pirates, heretics, or xenos they came across. The group master, Tyson Jacob, expected a series of swift and easy purgation campaigns, more extermination than true battles. He was well aware that deploying an entire battle group for such a mission was overkill. It was a gesture of exaggerated caution by Sector Command, intended to honor the Lord Solar and perhaps garner his favor. Then, without warning, two of Jacob's task forces vanished. The last reported position of Task Force 3 had been the far-flung Stanghald system, while Task Force 4 was believed to have been concluding operations against heretic cults in the Iron Tower system. Both fell suddenly silent. Task Forces 2 and 11 rerouted from their own objectives to investigate, only to vanish in turn. Growing increasingly disquieted, Group Master Jacob said word of the disappearances to both Sector Command and to Leontes's command spire on Sanctum, before summoning his remaining task forces to regroup in the Cisail system. It was during this muster that a ragged handful of ships from Task Forces 3 and 11 erupted from the warp on the fringes of the Cisail system. Every vessel was terribly damaged, many trailing flames and tumbling wreckage as they dragged themselves from the Empyrean. Those who could blared warnings to all who might hear. The Tyranids were coming, they cried. Not those of the Nautilon or Promethor tendrils, but another infestation rising up from below. The survivors' reports were garbled and, in some cases, tainted by madness. Their vid logs and auger exloads did not lie, however. These made clear that Tyranid bioships had completely overrun the outermost systems of the Bastior subsector, in numbers fit to blot out the star fields behind them. This new onslaught was swiftly dubbed the Grendelus Tendril, and prospectively classified as a Vermilion Alpha threat. The true extent of the danger could not yet be assessed, but Group Master Jacob knew it was his duty to assume the worst. The security of Lord Solar Leontus until the Sanctum Anchor world could not be risked. Even now, Jacob's astropaths were complaining of chittering and scrabbling in their minds, and a deadening pressure upon their psychic senses. The group master sent swift messenger ships to deliver his updated warnings, both to Sanctum and to the rest of the systems of the Bastior subsector. Then he gathered his warships and prepared to reconnoitre, and if possible, slow or even halt the Tyranids' advancing swarms. Jacob's choice was a courageous one, but also tremendously dangerous. Before the Swarm Group Master Jacob's warnings leapt between the subsectors' worlds like chain lightning. They prompted a flurry of differing reactions. Panic spawned rioting on Lethnor and gained as hope. Zealous jubilations on the fortress world of Unspeg, where the cult of Saint Vance the Martyr held sway. Widespread denial, even derision amongst the clergy and planetary governors of the Galospire system. How could base Xenos have outmaneuvered the might of mankind? These latter asked. Why would the god-emperor allow it? 
The dissenting voices of Galaspire became more vehement until High Frater Nylath decreed it heresy to even speak of the Grendelus Tendril, let alone prepare for its onslaught. His directive conflicted with that of the system's senior military officers to prepare for a full-scale Xenos invasion. Torn between blind faith and the frightening realities of the situation, the defenders of the Galaspire system factionalized and tensions escalated rapidly. The first shots of what would come to be known as the War of Closed Eyes were fired soon afterwards. Even as the Galaspire system descended into anarchy, the defenders of other worlds throughout the Bastior subsector responded to the Tyranid threat with swift determination. From the Barter Spires of Far Whelm to the sprawling aerodromes of Agrandais and the dust marsh nomad caravans of Zengran, all who could took up arms and prepared to fight for the God Emperor. Regiments of Astra Militarum soldiery adopted defensive positions behind huge battlements or deployed to fortified checkpoints throughout city streets, agri sprawls, and macro templum complexes. Vast concentrations of armored vehicles and artillery dug in around vital spaceports and fortresses, or rolled out to patrol stretches of wilderness and macro highways. Colossal subterranean generatorums thrummed to life, powering up defense lasers on void shields, while combat aircraft were moved to high alert and void ships departed their docks. In the Redapt, Castell, Pyramote, and Formidaira systems, the augmented might of the Imperial war machine growled to life and girded itself for the Tyrid's onslaught. As intelligence on the Xenos advance filtered through to Sanctum, however, one thing became clear to Leontus and his command staff. All the military might of the Bastior subsector would not be enough to halt the Grendelus Tendril. Whether by design, opportunistic instinct, or simply dark chance, this third and seemingly largest Tyranid Tendril had bypassed the might of the Sol Blades. It was pushing into what should have been the Imperial rear lines, in numbers even the most pessimistic Strategos could not have predicted. Already the shadow and the warp had fallen across the Stranghald and Iron Tower systems, cutting them off from all but wildly reckless warp jumps and choking the defenders' calls for aid. The same phenomenon was gathering around the Redapt system, communications from its astropaths becoming strained and infrequent. With Galaspire's worlds locked in civil war, this left just three of the subsector's seven Imperial systems able to fight back on their own terms. Lord Solar Leontus accordingly enacted what he called the Sanctuary Protocol. Powerful astropathic distress calls were sent echoing away through the Empyrean in the direction of the Segmentum Solar towards the nearest Anchor World subsectors, neither of which was close until the last reported locations of countless soul blades. Urgent and considerable reinforcements would be required, Leontus knew, for the defenders to stand a chance of victory. In the meantime, any loyalist forces in the Bastior subsector that could fall back to the Formidre, Pyamote, or Castile systems, now designated Sanctuary systems, were to do so immediately. They were to salvage all the ammunition, fuel, and useful manpower they could, but not at the risk of being trapped by the inexorable Tyranid advance. Any forces that could not retreat in this fashion, stranded by a lack of warp-capable craft, were instead ordered to dig in and hold out for as long as they could. They were commended for whatever time their courageous sacrifices would buy the three sanctuary systems. With luck, it would prove enough to allow fresh Imperial forces to arrive and tip the balance against the Tyranid menace. The Talons Dig Deep Ever more biofleets uncoiled from below the galactic plane to infest the Bastior subsector, where the Promethor and Nautilon tendril spared over multiple sectors, the Grendelus tendril instead seemed to be concentrating all its colossal might against a single subsector. Why this should be was unclear, though theories abounded. As with everything concerning the utterly ineffable Tyranids, humanity was left fumbling for understanding. Even the best strategic minds and most learned Ordo Xenos Inquisitors 
could do little better than to guess at when, why, or how the rapacious alien swarms would strike, let alone why this tendril strength should be so concentrated. Many Imperial commanders obeyed the Sanctuary Protocol. Void ships of all kinds arrived in the Castile, Pyamot, and Formidera systems, crammed with soldiers' war engines, logistical personnel, and military material. Armies of overworked strategium adepts and sleep-deprived officers coordinated the influx. Ground forces were deployed to strengthen the worlds of the Sanctuary systems, while all combat-capable void ships joined system monitor patrols and hastily scrambled reserve fleets. Hour by hour, the defense of the Sanctuary systems grew ever more impregnable, until it seemed that surely no enemy could overcome them. Certainly, the initial Tyranid feelers that quested into the Castile and Formidera systems were swiftly annihilated in the void by overwhelming Imperial firepower. All those who could not reach Sanctuary now faced the full horror of the Tyranid onslaught. Some panicked had attempted to flee or to hide in deep bunkers or remote caves. A scattering of vessels did escape Grindelis's clutches. Many more were caught in the open void, ensnared in the tendrils of hive ships that disgorged swarms of warrior organisms to butcher all aboard. Those who hid lasted longer, but every day another remote enclave was predated, another bunker complex infiltrated by vanguard organisms and reduced to a gruesome abattoir. Others in the outlying systems resigned themselves to their fate. The noble clans of Lethnor's high spires indulged in ever more debauched revels while Tyranids engulfed their world. Even as subterranean swarms bypassed their outer defences and tides of warrior organisms flooded up through the levels of Lethnor's highs, the orgiastic parties continued. In the end, it was the scything Lethoran soldiery who butchered the nobles while in the process of requisitioning their palatial spires to serve as final redoubts against the all-consuming swarms. For all those who lost their minds or their courage in the face of the Tyranid threat, there were many more who fought back. Some were motivated by their faith or by the desire to defend their homes and all they held dear. Others dug in and held on out of sheer spite, be that directed towards the alien swarms coming to devour them or towards those who had abandoned them to such a fate. In the Iron Tower system, Captain Veshwald of the Cordesan Light Infantry drew together a coalition of grim-faced Imperial survivors on the world of Donjon. Veshwald's survivors were trapped on a world whose oceans had become bubbling digestive acid and whose horizons were darkened by capillary towers and nests of tentacles taller than mountains. Despite the sanity-blasting sights around them and the apparently doomed nature of their campaign, the survivors fought on, held together by Veshwald's singular will and charisma. In the remote Redapt system, initial Tyranid attacks against the agri-world of Kornokog saw its orbital defences annihilated. Then, during the infamous Nine Days of Blood, its fortifications along the Mariaval line were reduced to corpse-choked ruins. Rather than lose heart, however, the Imperial forces trapped on Kornokog clung to their faith, embraced their hatred of the alien, and fought on. Tyranid synapse beasts led onslaughts into the Cornacog city domes, even as swarms of haruspexes and psychophages assailed the planet's hydroponic chasms. In response, Karnukog's defenders launched a blistering series of armoured and airborne counterattacks that halted the Tyranids in their tracks. Soon the world was locked in a sprawling global stalemate, that grew more savage by the day. There were scores more stories of defiance against the odds, and as many of bloody tragedy. Most were lost beneath the smothering shroud of the shadow in the warp, the horrifying miasmal maelstrom unleashed by the toxic swarms of Pavlor IV, the suicidal charge of the 840th Vostroyan Rough Riders that last saw the hated Witherworm slain. General Tonhir's disastrous airdrop into the heavily infested Magran Manufactorums, the last stand of the Gromdak super-heavy armoured, the War of Dragons, conducted in the endless skies of Nimir III, 
the dirge song march of the Erzentak saints. These and countless other conflicts saw the best and worst of the human spirit pitted against the dead-eyed malevolence of the Tyranid swarms. Alien, too, fought alien in this inter-system war of survival. Even as they prepared to set out from the Fijian system to invade neighbouring Formidir, the orc hordes of warlord Orsgog were attacked by Tyranid swarms. Delighted to find an excellent fight on their very doorstep, the orcs abandoned their invasion plans and hurled themselves at the Tyranids. Elsewhere, Karls and Grimnir of the Greater Thurian League and Kronos Hegemony rallied the leagues of Votan forces scattered through the St. Catherine's Tears asteroid belt. Forming their followers into oath bands, they launched a determined attack against the Tyranid infestation. Abandoned by their own leaders, many humans joined the Votan Alliance. Their aid was tolerated by the pragmatic clones in the name of expediency. Hrad, Mebrii, several Gulthiak Viro combines, and even, according to unconfirmed reports, a Jukero star frame engaged in their own battles against or fights from the Tyranids. Meanwhile, the alien death toll in the Palat system skyrocketed by the day as Tyranids, Necrons, Asuriani, and Jukari engaged a ferocious four way war. Ancient superweapons of unimaginable power were unleashed to annihilate entire biofleets. Warrior organisms spilled into the webway, triggering a separate and equally vicious conflict between the bounds of reality. Alien blood stained world after world, and still the fighting raged. Outliers For all the blood spilled, heroic sacrifices made and furious battles fought, the Tyranid advance continued. Where the defenders' warships, void platforms and ground forces were finite, the bioships and warrior organisms of the Grendilis tendril appeared numberless. They drifted from the interstellar void in waves. Each onslaught was greater and more terrible than the last, and while the defenders typically had hours or even days between one attack and the next, there was only so much that they could do with that time. Damaged warships were repaired and wrecks salvaged, but with the shadow of the warp settling over the embattled systems, there was no way to draft in reinforcements or replenish flotillas. Injured warriors were treated, weapons reloaded, and battered fortifications shored up. But after every battle, there were more dead to be heaped and burned, while stockpiles of ammunition and medical supplies only lessened. In Bastior's outlying systems, the defenders' numbers and morale grew ever more stretched, as the Tyranid's strength only seemed to increase. It was the 11th Tyranid attack that saw the last planet defenders of the Stanghald system overwhelmed. Until that point, garrison forces had held out on the worlds of Portent and Sigillus, supported by hit-and-run attacks from a ragtag fleet of Imperial Navy warships and Space Marine frigates. The eleventh onslaught was like nothing that had come before, however. Hundreds of bioships surged from the void, their number so great that the Imperial vessels could only fall back or be annihilated. Clustering around Portet and Sigillus, scores of high fleets vomited wave after wave of warrior organisms onto the planet's surface until every last spark of resistance was extinguished. Clustering around Portent and Sigillus, scores of hive ships vomited wave after wave of warrior organisms onto the planet's surface until every last spark of resistance was extinguished. A final desperate vox blurt reached the fleeing naval craft from the surface of Portent. It spoke of a towering hive tyrant leading the butchery, fighting with four crackling bone swords and displaying a terrifying strategic intellect. The shipmasters forced to abandon their comrades on the ground vowed to fight on in their honour. They would do all they could to hurt the colossal swarms now gathering to feed upon the system's slaughtered worlds. The Redapt system, too, faced one onslaught after another. Unlike Stranghald, however, its defenders had come to prepare for the coming storm. Unlike Stranghald, however, its defenders had time to prepare for the coming storm. On the worlds of Welm, Maur, Zve, and Rav, 
imperial forces fought with the ferocity of cornered prey. By the 19th Tyranid attack wave, the majority of the system's warships and orbital defense platforms had been reduced to hollow hulks drifting in the void. However, the Tyranids still had yet to gain a significant foothold on any settled worlds. Their adapt system might not have been able to contribute to the wider subsector's war efforts by this point, but neither was it about to collapse under the Xenos offensive. In the Gallowspire system, the war of closed eyes had seen countless Imperial lives lost to infighting. So entrenched had the position of the Xeno deniers become that even the arrival of bioships in the system was not enough to end the fighting. Consumed by zeal and with his hands too bloody to admit his mistakes, High Frater Nihilus instead accused the Loyalists of everything from conjuring illusions by heretic witchery to releasing weaponized Xeno fauna. Some of the governors and officers who had followed him into rebellion wavered, as Tyranid forces attacked renegades and Loyalists alike. Others doubled down upon their increasingly fantastical convictions, in some cases continuing to accuse their enemies of lies and trickery, even as Xenos dropped spores darkened their world's skies. Divided by hatred and paranoia, the Imperial defenders of the Gallowspire system suffered terribly beneath the Tyranid's talons. The onslaught intensifies. As resistance lessened in the wider subsector, so a colossal biofleet massed and surged up to attack the Pyre Mode system. The Sanctuary's defenders had hoped that the raging belts of rad storms that partly encircled their system might damage the Tyranid attack waves. If this was the case, however, there was no evidence visible as bioships flowed from midst the luridly glowing storms to attack. If anything, all this did was unleash swarms of irradiated Tyranids whose mere presence proved inimical to human life. Nor were the Tyranids the only aliens to assault Pyramode's worlds. Thundering from the void, aboard rad-saturated warships came a horde of mutated orcs led by a monster boss of glowing rock. Though they had been massively reinforced and had colossally fortified their worlds, still Pyramode Command had not anticipated having to withstand two alien invasions at once. A series of punishing naval engagements followed, during which 14 deep void watch stations were overrun and the industrial moon of Elodie lost to a catastrophe, the precise nature of which was swiftly classified. Soon after, Admiral Ranjav was forced to fight both Tyranids and Orcs at once during the chaotic battles of Gaitha Sound. She displayed strategic mastery in winnowing both attack waves but it cost her dozens of Imperial craft, along with her own Oberon-class flagship, the Spirit of Flame. Planetary invasions followed. The fortress world of Unspake, beset by Tyranid vanguard and aerial swarms, the hive world of Trig, facing hordes of heavily mechanized greenskins under the monster boss himself, the scriptorum world of, of Blot, assailed by Tyranids and Orcs at the same time. The only saving grace for the defenders of the power mode systems, the only saving grace for the defenders of the power mode systems, was that the orcs and tyranids slaughtered one another as willingly as they did their human prey. Still, if the sanctuary systems were to hold out until the arrival of imperial reinforcements, they could not afford to suffer such brutal losses at such ferocious a pace. The Castell system was assailed shortly after hostilities commenced in the Pyramode Sanctuary. Here, Imperial defensive measures proved successful, at least to begin with. Seven successive waves of hive ships and escort drones broke against the armoured prowess of the Navis Imperialis, Adeptus Mechanicus and Space Marine vessels, without a single organism making planet for. Inevitably, however, Imperial naval casualties mounted with each engagement. Worse, the Tyranids appeared to adapt to the ferocious resistance they faced. The Eighth Attack Wave was not only several times larger than that of any that had come before it, but also, amongst their seething masses, came strange bio-vessels that did not match any existing Imperial recognition scripture. Gangling things, trailing masses of spindly black tendrils, 
The craft boasted pulsating cerebral nose, each as large as an imperial frigate. Where the foul vessel went, so crippling paranoia, terrifying hallucinations, and smothering psychostatic, drove human naval crews mad and shattered their morale. From these same ghastly vessels, swiftly dubbed Mind Slayers, poured invasion waves composed almost entirely of warrior organisms adapted for psychic combat, accompanied by heavily armoured crusher swarms and tides of expendable warrior beasts. The Mind Slayers' spawn soon secured footholds on the battery world of Rachnor and the agri world of Rashlav. As fresh Imperial reserves moved up in response, the core of battle psychers stepped forth to engage the Mind Slayer's spawn, so the conflict in the Vastail system escalated into a nightmarish war of witches. Captain Agaman fired his storm bolter, shredding a termagant that was scuttling towards him. A mere drop in the ocean reflected the Ultramarine's first captain. Hundreds of warrior organisms surged between the trees of the dark world, known as Obsidria. They scrabbled over one another in their frenzy to sink talons and fangs into the Ultramarines facing them. The alien's sheer weight of numbers heaved trees up by the roots and bore them to the ground where they vanished under the chitinous tide. In the face of this onslaught, the warriors of Agamemnon's strike force were executing a disciplined fighting retreat. Several of their number had already fallen to the bio-ammunition or stabbing talons. Still, they maintained a hail of defensive fire as they paced backwards towards their extraction site. Agamemnon felt stern pride for his warriors as he watched them fight. Not one step was hurried or misplaced. Not one shot was rushed. Each flanking dash by the Tyranids was spotted and swiftly countered with raging gouts of flame and hammering bolt fire. All this despite the fact that the Ultramarines battled a veritable avalanche of suicidally ferocious warrior organisms. The Xenos' aggression remains hyperactuated, came Tyvus's voice through Agamemnon's vox bead. The first captain gunned down several more termagants and flicked his attention to his strategic auger before replying. Your theoretical, regarding the importance of Sample 17, appears more practical by the moment, Brother Apothecary. Our acquisition of the Node Beast's cerebral core certainly seems to have agitated them, said Tyvus, a wry note in his voice. I find myself the unwilling focus of their attention. Agamemnon could see the truth of this. Tyvus fought at the heart of the Ultramarine's formation, shielded by his brother's armoured forms, as though ensconced behind ceramite ramparts. Still, his war gear was gouged and stained for where Xenos after Xenos had ignored other threats in favour of firing upon or hurling themselves at him. Such monomania leaves that foe vulnerable brother, said Agamemnon, firing again and hearing the warning chime of a low ammo count from his weapon. They make no effort to seek cover from our shots and assail us only as obstacles on their route to you. Gratifying that my heightened peril provides a tactical advantage, First Captain, replied Tyvus, pausing to put a bolt round through the head of a bounding horror. Your optimistic disposition is inspirational. It has been remarked upon many times, brother, replied Agamemnon, deadpan. He thumbed his feed selector rune as a servo skull bobbed in to exact his spent clip and slam a fresh one home. Defend the bio-sample, and we shall continue to defend you. Chrono reads three minutes to extraction. Courage and honor, First Captain, said Tyvus by way of acknowledgement. Agamemnon repeated the words, muzzle flare strobing across his auto-senses as he unloaded bolt shells into the onrushing foe. Around him, the Terminators of squad Decius withdrew in lockstep, firing in controlled bursts. Codicia Valius paced alongside them, the runic wards of his armor glowing angrily. His features contorted with effort as he conjured blasts of psychic force despite the smothering presence of the shadow in the warp. Each manifestation hit the Tyranids like an invisible battering ram and sent broken carcasses tumbling. Squad Decius, fire pattern Ajax Meteoris, ordered Agamemnon. Squad Ulaxis, give them flame. 
The Terminators adjusted their aim, focusing on the outlier organisms Agamon had spotted encircling the Ultramarines. Meanwhile, the Infernus Marines of squad Ulaxes advanced through the gaps between the Terminators, pyroblasters leveled. They unleashed torrents of burning Prometheum, focused upon reaching Apothecaria Tivus. More than a score of Tyranid organisms surged straight into the billowing firestorm. Agamon heard their flesh crisping and their organic armor plates cracking in the heat. Their dying screeches sounded flat to his ear, autonomic sounds with nothing recognizable as emotion or sentience in them. Squadulaxus withdrew behind the Terminators again, the maneuver as smooth as the interlocking cogs of a finely tuned mechanism. Again, Agamon felt a swell of admiration for the Battle Brothers under his command. Maintain retreat and fire patterns, he barked over the Vox. Less than one hundred yards to the clearing. Runic designators show Eagle of Macrag on final approach. Be ready for combat extraction. Agamemnon heard the rushing roar of missiles firing in swift succession. He glanced to the far left of the line. There, dreadnought brother Julianos was unleashing a salvo of frag warheads into the swarms. The missiles burst amidst the trees and filled the air with tyranid ichor and jagged wooden sards. The flames drive the Xenos into my sight, Vox the interred pilot of the Ballastus Dreadnought. They seek to flank us. I am grateful. More foes to smite, to make pay for what their vile foe did on Macrag. Just so, brother, we... began Agamon. He was interrupted by a piercing scream that climbed so swiftly in pitch and volume that the first captain thought the eye lenses of his helm might shatter. Instead... They showed him a sphere of luminescent bioplasma swelling like a newborn star amidst the trees. Its fierce glare threw into stark illumination the hulking alien monster generating the deadly projectile within a caging bioelectric field. Scream a killer! shouted Terminator Sergeant Decius. Space Marines swung guns towards the huge carnifex, but too slowly. The beast unleashed its bioplasmic bolt with a whip crack of displaced air. The glowing orb shot through the arboreal gloom and hit dreadnought brother Julianus directly on the front of his armoured sarcophagus. Plasteel and ceramite melted under the impact. Arcs of motive force leapt from ruined systems. Smoke billowed thick and black as the dreadnought staggered and crunched shoulder first into a tree trunk. Brother Julianus, report, ordered Agamemnon. He received nothing but static in response. The ground shook as the screamer killer amongst the most well-known and loathed subspecies of the Tyranid Carnifex accelerated into a lumbering charge. Agamemnon felt grim resolve fill him as he saw the siege beast making straight for Brother Tivus. Somehow, he did not think it would balk at tearing through the Terminators or Squadesius to reach its prey. If left unchecked, the monster would gouge the heart from his strike force. This was something Agamemnon could not allow. Gritting his teeth, the first captain muttered a benediction of wrath to the machine spirit of his power sword and stepped into the charging beast's path. Before the carnifex could reach him, twin columns of laser energy stabbed through the gloom, sizing through trunks and sending burning treetops crashing down on the tyranids. The boss punched through one side of the carnifex's head and out the other. Agamemnon distinctly saw the beast's gimlet eyes glow scarlet, then burst as flames erupted from their sockets. The screamer killer's legs tangled beneath it, and it pitched onto its front, plowing a deep trench in the loam. I live, brother captain, replied the dreadnought, Lars cannon barrel still glowing from its killing shot, artificial voice ragged with pain. And I offer my thanks for the exemplary shot, Brother Julianos, said Agamemnon. Now, fall back to the extraction point. You have sustained sword damage, and I will not risk you or your legacy of wisdom. As you command, rasped Julianos. Step by ponderous step, he retreated into the hazy pool of daylight that marked the clearing in the dark woods. The rest of the ultramarines moved with the damaged dreadnought, focusing on shielding the apothecary in their midst and maintaining defensive fire. 
Brother Calastus fell to a flesh borer grub through the eyepiece of his helm just as they reached clear daylight. Terminator brothers Agrista and Palatus made it several steps further before something huge and scuttling with a war full of fangs and tentacles erupted from the gloom to tear them apart. Even as their vengeful brothers blasted the monster into ruptured ruin, the downdraft of the Eagle of Macrag caused the canopy to lash wildly. Gunship, we are ready for combat extraction and have Sample 17 secure, roxed Agimon. Understood, Lord, replied the crew helot pilot. Descending, be advised, Lord, there is urgent word from the Formidera system. Lord Sola Leontus has commanded immediate recall to all soul blades. The gunship landed with a violent scream of engines, its point defence guns hammering. Even though he had brought most of his battle brothers safe through the alien's onslaught, still, First Captain Agamon's hard-won triumph was punctured by the crew helot's words. As he backed, still shooting at the swarm, onto the embarkation ramp, Agamon's mind raced at the implications of what he had heard. The ramp rose, sealing the boiling mass of Tyranids without. The gunship's engines bellowed as the craft dusted off and climbed rapidly into Obsidiaria's cobalt skies. Even before they had reached the edge of the troposphere, Agamon had made his way up to the gunship's cockpit, his helm maglocked to his belt. The crew helots turned to look at him, eyes solemn and faces pale with worry. Tell me everything, Agamon commanded them. The Anvil of Sanctum With the Pyre Moat and Castile sanctuaries assailed, it seemed inevitable to the Imperial defenders of the Formidia system that they too would soon be under attack. Sure enough, out-system augurs and deep-void data oracles cried out their warnings as the first Tyranid bioships drifted into range. It soon became apparent that this would be an onslaught like no other. Where the other two sanctuary systems were subjected to successive waves of Tyranid attacks, the invasion of the Formidia system, once begun, was relentless. Unending rivers of bioships swarmed up through the ecliptic plain or encircled the Sar system like the tentacles of some predatory god. Hour by hour, the Tyranid vessels increased in number and monstrous enormity. Imperial augur screens flooded with crimson warning runes until they seemed awash with gore. The shadow in the warp thickened to a choking psionic miasma that spread terror and despair through the system's defenders. So densely packed and numerous were the Tyranid vessels that they became visible even from the surfaces of the system's settled worlds as dark tendrils spread across the star field. It was in this moment, as dread fell heavy upon the defenders' hearts, that the experience and foresight of Lord Solar Leontus and his veteran combat staff showed its worth. Knowing from bitter experience that unreasoning fear spread ahead of the Tyranid advance and that astropathic communication would be swiftly choked, they had prepared vid recordings and audio sermons in which they delivered stirring speeches to bolster Imperial courage. These had been distributed through the systems well ahead of the Tyranid's arrival with strict orders that they be played and replayed once the Xenos assault began. A great strength of ecclesiarchal priests had also been seeded through the ranks or even the smallest and most remote garrisons and ship crews. Their bellowed hymns now rang out alongside the inspirational oratory of Leontus and his most trusted generals, issuing from loud hailers, vid screens and vox emitters throughout the Formidia system. It was not a perfect solution. The bark of Commissar's bolt pistols cut through their recorded oration in some fortifications and trench lines. However, many were the backs that straightened, the jaws that set firm, and the hands whose tremors lessened as the servants of the God Emperor were reminded of their duties. So it was that, instead of panicking like cornered prey, the Imperial defenders stepped forth to meet the alien offensive on every front with as much determination and courage as they could muster. Ferocious void battles erupted around the industrial worlds of Fractam, the laboratory world of Lembig, and the hive world of Ogrim. The defensive batteries of the fortress world of Resolution's Ire 
fired until the gun barrels glowed. Yet invasion swarms continued to pour from the darkened skies. Even the star-scorched mortuary world of Krematos saw fierce conflict as vanguard organisms infiltrated its subterranean catacomb cities and brought bloody havoc. Meanwhile, wonder and terror engulfed the feudal world of Jovengast as an exocult erupted from amongst its downtrodden serf class, led by the tainted nobles of House Verschein. The uprising spread bloodshed and anarchy across the world's northern hemisphere, as loyalist cavalry and archers met alien horrors and cultists armed with contraband firearms. Yet the tide was turned, and the flames of war stoked higher, as the towering knights of House Terin and Griffith marched out in support of the loyalist forces. Though conflict raged across hundreds of separate fronts throughout the Formidia system, and though the Imperial defences proved equal to the task of holding back the Tyranids again and again, nothing could halt the apocalyptic biofleet that drove unerringly towards Sanctum. Fleets of the Imperial Navy, Adeptus Astartes and Adeptus Mechanicus, all sought to blunt the advancing swarm, all took their toll upon the myriad hive ships, yet none could halt the swarm's advance. Always there were more and yet more living warships to fill the gaps left by the slain. It soon became clear that war on Sanctum itself was inevitable. Dark whispers circulated amongst rank-and-file soldiery and command personnel alike that somehow the Tyranids knew the strategic value of the Anchor World and were determined to see it fall at any cost. Whatever the truth of such dire speculation, the simple fact was that every defensive reserve was already committed, every Imperial soldier already at war throughout the system. Sanctum stood alone against the onrushing might of the swarm. Sanctum Defiant The Grendelous Tendril surged towards Sanctum from all sides. Bioships flowed between the tumbling boulders of the Dawn Wall. In response, the asteroid belt came alive with blazing gun emplacements when missile batteries. Living warships shuddered and gouted icor, or fought back with colossal barbed spitters and lashing tendrils. The Battle of Sanctum had begun. From the mighty Tower of Gerzelm at its southern pole to the Sars Mitre orbital battery at its north, from the starport cum seaport of Crux Harbor to the continent wall of the Mon Solomar, the defenders of Sanctum looked to the skies. They crouched in trenches, crisscrossing the once verdant equatorial steppes. They packed bunkers and strongholds amidst the rocky crags and coniferous forests of Voth's Reach. They garrisoned the mountain range known as the Heights of Arturus through whose Cyclopean peaks threaded the tunnels and chambers of the White Templar's fortress monastery, the Holdfast. It was within this titanic fortress that Lord Sola Leontus had established his command sanctum. Now, through the myriad vid feeds and augurs at, at his command, the Lord Sola watched along with every Imperial guardsman, battle sister, knightly noble, cyborg Skitarius, titan princeps, and space marine on sanctum, as the sky bloomed with fire. There could be no mistaking the source of the detonations. The Tyranids had arrived en masse, and the Imperial Defense Fleet had engaged them with everything it had. Breaching the Dawn Wall The asteroids of the Dawn Wall hung thicker in some places, more widespread in others. Their spall formed a scattered shell that partially shielded Sanctum at a distance of approximately 200,000 miles out. As a conscious effort towards fortification, many had been grav-tethered and drawn closer to one another, using arcane Adeptus Mechanicus technologies dug into the very asteroids themselves. Within many of the larger rocky masses were void-sealed fortresses, gunnery stations, auger shrines, and launch bases for space-capable fighter and bomber squadrons. These garrisoned asteroids became the first battlefields of the invasion. Samkin Command were under no illusions that the Tyranids' onslaught would be halted at the Dawn Wall, and so many of its defenders were penitents, penal troops, servitors, and those who willingly swore themselves to a martyr's death. Redemptionist hymnals boomed through the claustrophobic confines of the asteroid bases as the garrisons fought and died. Their guns hammered, 
until ammunition reliquaries ran dry, cracking the chitinous shells and rupturing the innards of dozens of smaller Tyranid vessels. As void-born horrors enfolded the asteroids in nests of tentacles, or landed upon them and stalked forward on stilt-like talons, still the defenders kept shooting, kept praying. Squadrons of Imperial Void craft streaked through the gloom, raking colossal monsters with gatling cannons and rockets whose impacts flared silently in the icy vacuum. One by one, the Tyranids cracked the asteroids open and butchered the prey within. Ship-sized abominations crashed Imperial fortifications in their vast talons, or swallowed asteroids, installations and all. Barbed invasipositors, hundreds of feet long, punched through rock and plasteel to vomit warrior organisms into the heart of fortified complexes. Swarms of toxicrines and venom throats filled strongholds with correspondent spores that ate through the thickest bulkheads and choked those defenders not hurled into the void by explosive decompression. As resistance through the dawn wall began to falter, heavier hive ships with thick chitinous prows ploughed forward to barge the remaining asteroids aside and clear ragged corridors through which lighter bioships could follow. The enclaves of defiance held out across the asteroid belt. Soon enough, the main thrust of the Tyranid invasion pushed on towards the planet, and the enormous fleet of warships hanging in its orbit. So far, Imperial observers had characterized the Tyranid onslaught as steady, perhaps even surprisingly cautious. High Fleet Leviathan's reputation for malevolent cunning preceded it, however, and so the defenders were ready when the pace and direction of the attack suddenly shifted. With routes cleared through the Dawn Wall, other swarms of bioships that had so far hung back now surged towards the sanctum along cleared approach corridors through the open void. It seemed like the Tyranids had waited until they could launch their assault on the planet from every direction at once. Now they struck with all the force and vehemence of a predator, seeking to swiftly and decisively end its prey. The orbital defenders had no intention of allowing such a killing strike. Squadron after squadron of Imperial warships ignited their real space drives and surged forward to meet the alien foe. In their midst came the Phalanx, the flanks of its mountainous bastion blazing as the battle station opened fire with everything it had. More than three hundred Imperial Fist battle brothers rode aboard their mighty vessel, each oath sworn to defend Sanctum with their lives if need be. The opposing fleets met in a maelstrom of gnashing moors and flashing gun batteries, groaning metal hulls and flaring engines and miles-long barbed tendrils. Sparking wreckage and spurting boulders of torn flesh tumbled amidst dueling vessels, hurtling interceptors and vast shoals of boarding craft both biological and mechanical. Casualty figures rapidly spiralled beyond even the most talented logisters' capacity to tally. Groupmaster Jacob led the fight over Sanctum's northern hemisphere, while Captain Tor Garadon masterminded the Southern Void Theatre from the command Sanctum of Phalanx. Their shared operational doctrine was simple and robust. In the first instance, Priority was given to preventing Tyranid vessels from slipping through to drop invasion swarms onto the planet. The secondary priority was given to eliminating the largest hive ships, in the hopes that this would somehow disrupt whatever passes for a command and control architecture within the alien's colossal fleet. In the end, the Imperial warships were more successful in the second objective than the first. Amidst the icor drenched bedlam raging through the void, Numerous macro-class hive ships were blown apart or reduced to burning and blistering ruin. Numerous macro-class hive ships were blown apart or reduced to burned and blistered ruin. However, it became increasingly clear that trying to prevent the Tyranids' planet fall was like attempting to hold back a flood with bare hands. Bioships braved enfiladed torpedoes, raking lance fire and hammering volleys from Sanctum's orbital defense emplacements to skin the upper atmosphere and release clouds of invasion spores upon the world below. Many bioships paid the price for their boldness, their shattered carcasses tumbling limply through Sanctum's low-orbit approaches, venting slicks of I-Core 
or else were seized in gravity's acquisitive embrace and dragged down to a fiery end. None of this prevented warrior organisms in their millions, then billions, from landing on Sanctuary's surface. Again and again, armoured counterattacks and saturation bombardment by Imperial artillery scoured the Tyranid, landing zones, yet even these measures could not hold the Xenos back. First in isolated pockets, then spreading like the stigmata of some foul alien disease, the swarms darkened the landscape. Now came the ground war. The Devouring Swarm The fighting on Sanctum's surface was fluid, verging on chaotic. Tyranid swarms infested regions of remote wilderness where they could make planet fall relatively unscathed, growing in number with every rain of invasion spores before surging towards the nearest Imperial strongholds. These attacks were met whenever possible by armoured counteroffensives. Leontus and his strategic corps had issued standing orders for the defenders to retain mobility and avoid being fully besieged for as long as possible. Battles erupted across the planet's plains, mountainous regions, moons, moors and forests as Imperial officers sought to obey these commands. On the Kazavin steppes, over a dozen hard-pressed Astra Militarum regiments fought tirelessly to keep three Tyranid invasion swarms from melding into a single super swarm that could threaten Crux Harbor from the south. As their fight became ever more desperate, Titans of the Legio Destructor marched out in support, only to be met by colossal Hyrodule Bio-Titans and ground-shaking swarms of Tyrannofixes. The forest of Voth Reach blazed as battle sisters of several orders fought side by side to hold back the Tyranid swarms. The Adeptus Auroritas raised their voices in soaring battle hymns as they plied their massed flame weapons, incinerating swathes of ancient woodland along with the Tyranids infesting them. Such tactics slowed the Xenos, but could not entirely halt them. Mile by mile, the battle sisters and their columns of armoured transports were forced to fall back towards the fortresses in the higher crags. Battling across the Icor slick glaciers around the Tower of Gelsem, holding the breaches of the Archipelago Disporum and the island's vital airfields against swarms erupting from the deep ocean, fending off subterranean and airborne assault swarms around the desert fastness of the Oasis of Fire. In these and many other locations across the planet, humans met Tyranids and fought for control of vital territory. Again and again, the combined might of the Adeptus Mechanica, Space Marines, Battle Sisters, Knightly Houses, Titan Legions, and Astra Militarum prevailed. Yet still, the wider strategic picture worsened as hours of conflict became days. The Tyranids, too, won many victories, and where their prey possessed finite strength, the Xenos appeared without number. As more and more leader organisms survived planetfall, so their synaptic web expanded and grew more robust. As it did so, the strategies employed by the Tyranid swarms became increasingly cunning. The salts of individual swarms began to interlock and provide mutual support. Tides of organisms expended themselves in sacrificial onslaughts in order to allow others to outflank or ambush Imperial forces. Worst of all, Repeated reports emerged from the Pentecostes plains that the Swarm Lord had been sighted leading the attack there. It appeared that a notorious monster had been spawned again by the hive mind to coordinate the onslaught in that sector. Its presence threatened the security of the Holdfast itself, which lay east of the plains. Lord Solar Leontus' supreme command sanctum was now imperiled. To the Walls as the Tyranids overran ever more territory, so the Imperial defenders were forced to retreat to their fortresses and dig in. Some strongholds were rudimentary at best. There were many Astra Militarums who, with their trenches overrun and their routes of retreat severed, pulled back to bunkers and flakboard redoubts in the knowledge that they were making their last stands. Other strongholds were more formidable, be they the Shroud Wall forts around Crux Harbour, the colossal bastions of the Sars Mitre Orbital Battery, 
or the vast and mountainous walls of the Mon Solomar. The garrison forces of the latter fell under the dual command of Canoness Persephone of the Order of the Eben Chalice and High Magos Verbosimir of Mars. Between them they maintained a masterful defence that saw seething oceans of Tyranids held back from half a continent's worth of territory. Some besieged strongholds held firm, their artillery positions and wall guards raining fire down into the boiling moats of Tyranids building around their ramparts. Others sent out increasingly frantic distress calls as broods of Lictors or Von Ryan's Leapers infiltrated their positions. Rains of Tyrannocyte spores fell within their walls and floods of warrior organisms poured through their breached redoubts. In the last hours of defiance at St. Spire, several void ships resorted to bombarding the site from space without targeting coordinates in an attempt to atomize the invading horrors. At Fort Luthion, a mass of psionic war beasts drove the defenders into a state of mindless terror that much of the garrison had butchered one another before the Tyranids even breached the perimeter. The entire Alvin back line fell in a day after a single soldier was infected by a parasite of Mortrax, then toppled through an open bunker hatch before the Rippers infested his body and burst free. The last transmissions from that doomed fastness were described as naught but screams and chewing. Amidst all the horror and carnage, no greater invasion swarm was witnessed than that which assailed the whole fast. From the west thundered the swarm lord and its hordes, pouring heedless through the minefields and raking artillery barrages of the Pentecast plains to assault the foothills of the heights of Arturus. At the same time, a second equally colossal swarm, whose presence had previously been mistaken for a collapsing tectonic fault, thanks to its mass subterranean approach, struck from the east. Hundreds of trigons and warlocks spearheaded this attack, some emerging on the mountainous slopes, others erupting into the catacombs of the Holdfast. Tides of warrior organisms burst from their tunnels, tyrannid warriors and primes marshalling countless termagants, hormigons and barbgorns. Tervigans lovemered amongst the masses, spawning yet more broods of beasts. Meanwhile, since the venom throops drifted forward, seeking to spread their toxic spores through the holdfast chambers. Most terrifying of all, stalking ever closer came a trio of immense Norn emissaries, their black gimlet eyes fixed unerringly upon the high peaks of the holdfast, within which laboured Leontus and his command staff. In the desperate orbital battle over Sanctum, few Augur adepts had time to register the blooming of warp signatures beyond the dawn wall. The first real indication of the odds changing came from the surviving stations amidst the asteroid field. Ragged Vox Blurts spoke of Imperial warships thundering in from the deep void with lance batteries blazing and turrets spitting fury. Ripples ran through the tyranid void swarms above Sanctum, and suddenly entire broods of bioships were peeling away to meet fresh incoming threats. Seizing their chance, Group Master Jacob and Captain Garadon rallied their badly moored fleets and sought to consolidate their positions. None dared hope, for though they had wrought spectacular carnage amongst the Tyranid swarms, still barely a third of the Imperial warships remained to continue waging a war they had surely been mere hours from losing. Still, as fresh contact wounds flickered on auger screens and the dark silhouettes of Imperial warships slid between the Dawn Wall's asteroids to engage the Tyranids, the truth became clear. Against all hope, loyalist reinforcements had arrived. There was a chance that the pivotal anchor world could be saved. Hold fast. The two Tyranid super swarms closed upon the heights of Arturus like the doors of some colossal beast. Winged terrors beyond counting turned the skies pitch black with their numbers. The very bedrock of the mountains shuddered with stampeding alien footfalls, while within the holdfast, lumen flickered and stonework cracked as massive bio-artillery pounded the stronghold seemingly from every angle. The shadow in the warp swirled thick and cloying through the soles of every imperial defender. Dread settled over them like a smothering shroud. It was in this moment 
the Leontos and Chapter Master Stavro earned again their status as celebrated heroes of the Imperium. The Lord Solar applied every iota of his skill as a strategist to the unfolding battle. Even as he employed all his talents as a raider, diplomat, and unforgiving drillmaster to uphold morale. When he wasn't standing over a Stratego's hollow table, directing troop movements and fire patterns, Leontus was touring the outer battlements and marshalling yards of the Holdfast astride his cyber steed. He displayed contempt for the salvos of living ordnance raining down upon the White Templar stronghold never even flinching as small minds and raging spheres of bioplasma detonated against the void shields overhead. Wherever Leontus went, he buoyed the spirits of humans and posthuman alike, gauging where each fresh band of soldiers needed a rousing speech, a stark reminder of a duty, or a humble and heartfelt expression of honour. Leontus moved with a half-mile-long trail of bodyguards, strategic advisers, senior command and communication staff, tech priests, ecclesiarchal preachers, and psycho savants in tow. He was constantly hooked into the updated situation of the wider battle. He further monitored the war across Sanctum and beyond, and worked relentlessly to outthink and outmaneuver the leader beasts of High Fleet Leviathan. If Leontus was the heart and mind of the Holdfast, Chapter Master Stavro was its blade-wielding fist. Where Morlocks and Trigons broke into the Holdfast depths, Stavro headed each punishing counterattack to drive the Tyranids back and seal the breaches with blasting charges. Where mass siege beasts or broods of pulsating toxicrines threatened to rout the defenders of the lower passes, Stavro led armoured spearheads and gunship-mounted strikes to hurl them back. He seemed tireless, endlessly wrathful, and, despite the acid burns and talon gouges marring his white power armor, as invincible as if he had been blessed by the Emperor himself. Nor were such august individuals the only heroes of the Holdfast defense. From the defense of Zaglos Gate to the recapture of the Precipice Batteries, the last stand of the Bastrus Armorium, to the purge of Henval Stair, Enough acts of selfless courage and desperate determination took place to fill a library. Still, it was not enough to halt the immense tide of warrior organisms breaking against the heights of Artorias. The Northland Pass fell after an avalanche of Hormagons overwhelmed the Curtain Wall, and the gun emplacements it shielded fell silent soon after. Spore beasts tainted the lower catacombs of the Draxon Peak Bastion so that only power-armoured warriors could survive within the tunnels. Even then, they could only dash from one safe zone to another amidst poisoned murk and stalking monsters. Swarms of harpies reduced the Glyvorn Peak missile silos to melted ruin before massed bioartillery caved the entire structure in. The resultant collapse detonated the peak's ammunition reserves and left a gaping rent through which warrior organisms poured. With the skies darkened, day and night had no meaning. The defenders fought on doggedly, yet their casualties mounted and the fortress they manned became ever more heavily damaged. All the while, the three Norn emissaries stalked through the fighting with eerie alien grace, closing inexorably upon objectives only they knew. One of them struck on the eighth day of the siege, having compressed its mass into the seemingly impossible confines of a decommissioned turbolift shaft, then crawled steadily upwards for untold hours. The towering monstrosity burst into the Erythrad Peak Command Sanctum, where it slaughtered hundreds of screaming strategos and command adepts, and destroyed scores of irreplaceable cogitator banks. The beast would have escaped to strike again elsewhere, had it not been for an unnamed chapter serf, who selflessly sealed the blood-drenched sanctum and triggered the plasma denial charges, reducing the entire peak to a glassy crater. The second emissary, whose distinctive scars identified it to Imperial Strategos as the infamous Fiend of Hag Rift, surged from a Trigon tunnel to attack the White Templar's Gene Seed Vault. It was supported by swarms of lesser warrior organisms and a pair of Neuro Tyrants. In response, Marching from the chapter's vault of repose came almost a score of White Templar's dreadnoughts, 
who held back the Tyranids in an increasingly desperate and one-sided struggle. Almost all of the ancient warriors were slain, a dreadful loss to the chapter. But their sacrifices brought time for Colonel Ovida of the Ortegan Grenadiers to launch a massive counterattack and drive the Tyranids back. When the vengeful chapter master Stavro arrived at the head of a White Templar strike force, the fiend of Hag Rift was badly wounded and its swarm devastated. Yet the malevolent monster itself escaped to fight another day. For all the butchery and horror wrought by its fellows, it was the third Norn emissary that struck the most crucial target. Scaling the snow-whipped peak of the tallest mountains in the heights of Dartorias, the creature lurked in wait amidst rock and ice for its prey to emerge. Below lay the wide-open square of the Ascendorum, a great plaza wrought from a mountainous plateau dotted with braziers, statuary, shield generatorums, and flak batteries. In better times, the White Templars had mustered on this open space to perform rituals and bestow honours beneath the starry vaults of Sanctum Skies. Now, Lord Solar Leontus was crossing the open plaza astride Constantine, with his entourage about him. The Norn emissary knew its prey Sirenic Spore. Its black eyes followed him, its ropes of muscle and tendon tensed, and then it leapt out into thin air. The Norn emissary dropped towards the plaza, sword-like talons extended, angling its huge mass to slam down directly atop Leontus. From below came screams, but someone spotted the danger, and many amongst Leontus's entourage raised weapons. The Lord Solar himself looked up, registering his doom descending upon him too swiftly to be avoided. Messar streaked in and struck the Norn emissary in the flank when it was scant feet above Leontus's head. The impacts blossomed into concussive fireballs. Their force hurled the huge tyrannies aside, even as their shock waves unhorsed the Lord Solar and threw him and many of his companions flat upon the flagstones. The Norn emissary bucked in the air, like or gouting from its wounded flank, and turned its tumble into a cat-like landing with grace nothing so huge should possess. It hissed as a gilded gunship that had fired upon it streaked overhead, then banked sharply with a flare of engines and came in for another pass. The craft's rear ramp whined open as it flew closer, and hulking warriors clad in ornate auramite armor dropped from it one after another to slam down in the plaza with enough force to crack stone. The gunship's weapons blazed again. This time the emissary was ready. Leaping and swinging huge talons in a scything arc, it tore the cockpit from the gunship and sent it spiraling down the mountainside in flames. The emissary wheeled and surged with serpentine speed towards Leontus, who was still staggering to his feet. Blood ran down his pale face from a bad scalp wound. Though he fumbled to draw his sword, the Norn emissary's prey was in no condition to defend himself. The monster reared above him. The newly arrived golden warriors moved with incredible speed and merciless focus. Those of the Lord Solar's retinue, not swift enough to clear a path, were smashed aside with bone-breaking force, as Trajan Valoris and his custodians raced to interpose themselves between Leontus and his would-be Azenos assassin. The Norn emissary was just paces from its victim, when a hammering volley of bolt fire from the custodian guardian spears arrested its charge. The monster staggered, then lunged with a shriek, snatching up the nearest custodian and tearing one arm from his body before swinging him by the other and hurling him away. Trajan Valora stepped in and aimed a mighty stroke with the Watcher's axe that shattered several of the emissary's talons. The towering Xeno beast fainted back, then sprang past Valoris and attempted to snatch up Leontus. The Lord Solar had, by now, recovered his wits, however, and hurled himself backwards to evade the monster's grasp. Bodyguards and chanting priests pressed forward, raking the Norn emissary with fire from Laz guns, pistols, and a handful of plasma weapons. The monster swatted its attackers aside like insects and sent broken bodies tumbling across the plaza. The next instant it reeled and screeched as several custodian blades hacked into its flesh. Eyes still fixed unerringly on the retreating Lord Solar, the Norn emissary lashed about itself with blistering speed. A custodian was borne aloft and ripped bodily in two. Another was kicked so hard that his head cleared the plaza, 
and vanished over the precipice before his blood-spurting body had even toppled. Yet another was stomped into the flagstones, even his toughened bone structure and auramite armor not enough to prevent his death. The golden wall between the Norn emissary and its prey was thinning. All the while, Leontis's defenders and the remaining custodians were pouring fire into the colossal alien abomination. A scything blow of the Watcher's axe slit the cable-like tendons of the beast's right ankle and set it limping. A plasma blast, either skillfully placed or incredibly lucky, melted the right side of the emissary's face into a fused mass of cooked flesh. Bolt rounds fired by custodians blasted chunks of chitin and showers of ichor from the creature's limbs and body. Still the Norn emissary fought on. Its whipping tail broke another custodian's neck and sent his body clattering across the plaza. A final desperate effort saw the beast hurl itself forward, jaws gaping to close upon Lord Solar Leontas like a trap slamming shut. Yet Valorus was there at the crucial moment. Watcher's axe swinging in a meteoric arc to embed itself in the side of the Norn emissary's skull and smash its head aside. The Xenos monster crashed to the ground, crushing more than a score of Leontis's aides under its bulk. Yet, its last strike at the Lord Solar had been fended off by the Captain General of the Emperor's own bodyguards. Valorus and his one surviving custodian kept their weapons leveled at the monster as it twitched and heaved, but it did not try to rise again. Icor flooded from its grievous wounds, steaming as it cooled and began to freeze upon the cracked flagstones of the plaza. Lord Solar Leontas looked gravely around at the carnage, then up at the stern-faced demigod who had interceded to save his life. Expression somber, Leontas raised his hands and wordlessly offered the Captain General of the Adeptus Custodes the sign of the Aquila. Valoris returned the gesture, then calmly set about checking his war gear and loading the eagle's scream. The life of the Lord Solar had been saved at terrible cost, and the defenders of Sanctum had received reinforcements, but there was still a world's worth of war to be waged. Xeno War The timely arrival of reinforcements to Sanctum had prevented the Anchor world from losing both its orbital defense force and its strategic command center. It had also ensured, by the barest of margins, the survival of one of the Imperium's great war leaders. Yet the situation upon Sanctum and across the wider Bastior subsector remained desperate. Racing to respond to Sanctum's astropathic distress calls, Captain General Valoris had gathered more soul blades to him each time his ships dropped out of the warp to reorient to their next jump. Other Imperial forces, both Soul Blades and Crusading Flotillas, had also heard the cry for aid. Following the few stable warp routes to converge upon the Bastior subsector, these Imperial forces massed together as they neared their destination. Even as the war raged about the lower slopes of the heights of Artorias, and assault swarms hurled themselves at Crux Harbor and the Mon Solomar, Valoris was holding a hurried council of war with the shipmasters and soul blade leaders who had rallied to his banner. He even found himself addressing two battle groups from the Indomitus Crusade fleet Sextius, as well as a trio of ominous and unresponsive vessels that hailed from the mysterious Silent Seventh. The plan for relieving the Bastior subsector was basic and robust by necessity. Executing warp jumps into a region blighted by the shadow in the warp would be a dangerously inexact science, and there was no way to know what awaited beneath the Tyranid's psychostatic veil. Valoris had assigned roughly equal forces to jump to the Pyre Moat, Castale, and Formidera systems, and task smaller fleets with the security of the Redapt and Galaspire systems. The rest of the subsector would have to wait for a further Imperial reinforcements. When they executed their final assault jumps, the Imperial ships did not attempt to follow approved Navis Nobilite charts, for such routes could not be relied upon beneath the shadow in the warp. They leapt into the void, prayers to the Emperor blaring from every vox emitter, crews hoping their navigators possessed the skill to bring them safely out of the warp again at their destination. Not all made it. Navigators fumbled the tenuous threads of the Astronomicon's light, or simply went insane. 
Even once they had successfully torn through the veil and back into real space, some warships found themselves adrift in the interstellar void, or else emerged directly into swarming masses of bioships. For all their hardships, however, the returned soul blades and their allies brought relief to Imperial defenders upon the verge of breaking. In the Castell system, the sieges of Ravlok and Rashlav were broken as warships of the Raven Guard, Blood Angels, Black Templars, and others struck from the void. The Pyre Mode Sanctuary, too, felt the fury of the Adeptus Astartes, as warriors of more than a dozen chapters engaged the monster boss of Trig and reinforced the defenders of Unspake, Blot, and Grail. The largest relief force had been routed to Formidira and the aid of Sanctum, and was led by Valoris himself. It was this fleet that drove into the battles raging through the Dawn Wall and above Resolution's ire, Ogrim and Praktan. It was their vessels that tore into the Tyranid rear guard and slaughtered enough bioships to allow Sanctum's mauled defense fleet to rally. During the orbital bloodbath that followed, Valoris commanded immediate combat drops by fresh custodies and space marine forces to leave the worst besieged strongholds. Not to be outdone, Tor Garadon had insisted the Phalanx contribute to this effort. So it was that, amongst the mighty attack wave of drop pods and gunships that burned down through the aerial swarms to relieve the hold fast, there were many whose hulls bore the proud heraldry of the Imperial Fist. The reinforcements turned several planet-wide wars in the Imperium's favor and rescued others from the brink of catastrophe. But some conflicts were beyond saving. The battery world of Rucknor, the laboratory world of Limbic, and the luckless night world of Void had all been overrun. Imperial forces deployed to these war zones could do little but exact revenge upon the alien monsters, even now devouring the slaughtered world's biomass. More disturbing was the silence from the Stranghald, Iron Tower, and Galaspire systems, to which only a handful of scout ships had been sent, and from where none had yet returned. It remained unclear whether any Imperial resistance survived in those star systems. The war for the Bastior subsector had been rescued from complete collapse, but levels of Tyranid infestation remained terrifyingly high, and the Tyranids firmly retained the upper hand. Fresh invasion swarms erupted from the void daily, while the Swarm Lord was still at large upon beleaguered Sanctum, and that world's fortresses remained besieged. The Imperial defenders prayed that more reinforcements must be en route, not least the many soul bays as yet unaccounted for. What none said, but many feared, however, was that if enough soul bays had fallen back to reinforce Bastior, then surely the Promethor and Nautilon tendrils would be freed to recommence their inexorable advance. This was a war that was only just beginning, and which looked set to escalate to nightmarish new heights of savagery across the Bastior subsector and far beyond in the days to come.